Okay. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to have uh, here as our as our guest, Dr. Hauji Naziz, uh, to speak with us in our series of uh, uh, of interviews with people on people centered responses to the COVID pandemic. Haujin is uh, currently an academic at the American University of Iraq at the Gender and Development Center. Uh, she, she's been a Kurdish activist uh, uh, and a poet uh, who spent over three years in Rojava helping to rebuild uh, the region following the war with ISIS. And she was one of the first international activists to live and work in Rojava and has gained a deep insight into the region. So she's here to t talk to us a, 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 a little bit about Rojava, but we'll also uh, 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 find out from her about the experience in Rojalat, Rojalat which is the uh, Iranian region of, of, of Kurdistan as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, just to, to, to start, if you could, if you could, if you could uh, share with us a little bit about uh, how uh, the pandemic is being experienced, what the kinds of consequences of the pandemic and how the movements uh, have responded on the ground uh, in Rojava. Thank you so much, Thomas. Uh, really appreciate being here with you today. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an introduction into how Rojava has responded to the pandemic. And, and then I'm going to do a bit of a comparison with how uh, the Kurdish people in Rojhalad, the Kurdish parts of Iran, have uh, responded uh, to the pandemic and have attempted to find solutions through this process. What we'll see uh, very, very briefly to give you a bit of a foreshadowing is that the responses have largely been dependent on the way in which the dominant or the, the governments, both in Syria and Iran, have responded uh, to their communities and to their nation. So in Rojava, we know that we have a self-administrative autonom autonomous region, which has largely been politically independent. Um, and so when the pandemic broke out, the response was immediately one based on collective communal solutions and responses. Um, you know, in some of these other regions, for example, here in Iraq, in the Kurdish parts of Iraq, uh, there were immediately uh, uh, lockdowns play, uh, put into place to allow people to be protected. A uh, similar thing obviously happened in Rojava. Java. But I think a really important discussion is the way in which communities accepted and adapted to some of these lockdowns mm. in a place such as Rojava, uh, where the communities are, uh, you know, represented, there's grassroots democratization happening, there is all kinds of cooperatives and communes and, uh, you know, community based processes and politicization and involvement. Uh, the community in Rojava knew that the lockdowns and the quarantine process was absolutely necessary. Mm. It was particularly necessary because for the last couple of years we've seen a massive humanitarian embargo placed on Rojava by Turkey, led by Turkey, um, who engages in significant amounts of diplomatic work to try to prevent any form of uh, political recognition, any form of support, funding, aid flowing into Rojava. So when the pandemic ha uh, occurred, the people of Rojava were very, very quick uh, to respond and implemented a, a Rojava-wide uh, uh, quarantine. However, this was made much more difficult because the health system in Rojava is really, really suffering, mainly because of this quarantine, but also because late in December 2019, as a result of interference um, and national interest by countries such as Russia or China, uh, the border between Iraq um, and uh, Syria, uh, called the Al Yarubia uh, border crossing, was officially uh, basically deemed uh, closed. No humanitarian aid can flow anymore from, from this particular border region. While in contrast, and not surprisingly, the border crossings that are currently under control by the Turkish invasion in northern Syria have been allowed to continue to function, allowing Turkey to control the narrative and the discussion in relation to what kind of aid is flowing in, uh, painting a colonizing, invading, violent force as, uh, you know, as sort of a savior, protecting the people, providing aid. We see images on social media of Turkish, um, you know, forces and, uh, you know, humanitarian workers providing food packages to people that they have helped to displace. Oh. So Russia uh, demanding that, and Russia and China vetoing the UN Security Council's decision to allow the border to be uh, remain opened really has had a hugely detrimental impact. Uh, later in January 2020, Russia actually pressured many of the United Nations uh, organizations and bodies and institutions 
elections to actually uh, start only flowing through the Damascus, through the official government channels, which has, again, limited the capacity of aid, particularly medical aid and supplies to flow on from the government up into, uh, into where Rojava, the Rojava region is. So what we're seeing is a deliberate attempt uh, by some of these governments based on their own personal, regional and geostrategic interest to try to limit the amount of medical health care funding, um, you know, aid, uh, food, nutritional supplies, education, and some of these humanitarian packages from coming through, which begs the question, why is this happening? You know, we've mm. just come from a uh, you know couple of months in 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 uh, 2019 where um, Turkey invaded and took over uh, you know further regions under this concept of a security region uh, to protect its security interests, despite the fact that Rojava and the forces functioning in Rojava have never even shot a single bullet into the Turkish border. Um, so this raises a lot of questions, which is very, very interesting because it seems that there is an international objective to try to uh, basically suffocate Rojava, mm. prevent it from being able to continue to function without uh, openly appearing to do so. The international community with, uh, you know, from Russia to the United States, uh, to Europe, to the EU, to UN, stood by and watched as Turkey invaded, massacred uh, citizens uh, in 2019. Back in 2018, it did the same thing in Afrin region. Hundreds of thousands of people were displaced. So in Rojava, what we're seeing is multiple different layers of oppression and violence. Rojava is coming back, uh, coming off the back of this uh, two-year process of invasion, annexation, violence, and terrorism, and efforts by the Turkish state to, uh, you know, reorganize remnants of ISIS and different terrorist factions and organizations, and to basically use them to attack and destabilize the Rojava region. At the same time, we're seeing a complete humanitarian, you know, embargo and cut off. Um, so it's absolutely a reflection of the revolutionary soul and struggle of the people of Rojava that they continue to function, let alone continue to exist. What we've seen to date in relation to COVID and spread of COVID so far is that we've had only one death in the Rojava region. Mm. We haven't had, uh, although logically we can assume that undoubtedly COVID exists and it is among the people, but to date we haven't seen large numbers of death, which is thankfully very, very important, particularly when we think, again, there's no aid and the infrastructure is very, very limited. The infrastructure has been heavily damaged as a result of the war with ISIS um, and the invasion by Turkey. Um, the interesting thing is when this particular individual, this man who had contracted COVID, um, was taken to hospital by the UN, uh, you know, humanitarian forces. Uh, he was taken to the city of Kamishlu and taken to a hospital controlled by the uh, by the regime. Uh, the man passed away subsequently as a result of contracting corona, um, but it was up to about three weeks before the United Nations, uh, you know, humanitarian forces informed the Rojava administration that this individual had died as a result of coronavirus. Wow. So this again raises the question of why are these international humanit humanitarian organizations uh, so willing to abide by very, very oppressive and discriminatory international, uh, you know, interest such as Turkey, such as uh, Russia, such as, you know, some, the regime itself. It really raises a lot of interesting questions. And I think we all, we inevitably come back down to the answer that there's an effort internationally and globally, economically, politically, security-wise to try to suffocate Rojava and prevent its uh, revolutionary ob objectives, its revolution to achieve a higher level of success. Um, unfortunately for these forces, uh, we've seen significant amounts of positive elements um, and successes emerge from Rojava. We've seen women's communes and cooperatives. We've seen women's self-defense forces who have protected themselves. We are seeing communities that are not only you know, struggling through a uh, multi-layered war being imposed on them, but are actually thriving and continue to remain healthy and protect each other and maintain those strong community bonds. This is, again, despite the fact that international solidarity has really waned. Uh, there's a lot of criticism in relation to Rojava uh, coordinating, trying to, uh, you know, gain arms or some sort of uh, military support from the United States, which according to some inter 
international leftist has reflected very badly on Rojava because surely if you are in a very tight place between uh, ISIS forces, between a regime that wants to kill you and another uh, government across the border who is building a wall three meters high made out of concrete that is about 800 kilometers long and is uh, funding, actively funding and rearming terrorist groups uh, and is, um, you know, making active um, policies and processes to invade you, you are supposed to, as the oppressed and the colonized and the dispossessed, to simply lay down and die. Mm. So there's a lot of factors involved in what's happening in Rojava, but then nevertheless, we are incredibly proud that Rojava has maintained its revolutionary objectives and continues to thrive. But, uh, you know, just before we start our conversation, Thomas, I mentioned the importance and the necessity of international solidarity and support. Mm. A revolution can only survive if there are certain amounts of support being provided, not only moral support and ideological support, but also support in relation to aid coming through, to medical supplies coming through. Uh, the United Nations has only provided Syria with about 1,000 testing kits, mm -hmm. and we can only imagine the, the numbers of these testing kits that would have been flown, uh, flown you know, down into uh, the Rojava region. Um, so the Rojava administration has been forced to buy its own testing kits and its own respirators, which is obviously very, very difficult to do at the moment because there's high demands for them. Um, and so the situation is incredibly difficult. And again, we need to mention international solidarity, but international solidarity that is active and that is concrete in the form of funds going in, in the form of medical supplies going in, in the form of actively trying to protest what the international community is doing and what's so-called international humanitarian organizations are attempting to do. So there's a lot happening, but nevertheless, despite the uh, dire situation and the difficulties, we need to remain always positive and hopeful that uh, Rojava is still trying to struggle through this mm. situation. Mm. So all the more power mm. to Rojava. Yeah, yeah. Well, that very informative. Thank you for that overview. Thank you. Um, uh, and in terms of going forward, going forward uh, uh, in in the region, it seems like, uh, as you say, the uh, virus hasn't really had too much of an impact, and people have been, uh, uh, despite the difficult situation, uh, there's been a lot of uh, solidarity uh, inside uh, amongst the people on the ground, and uh, they're doing okay, it seems. Um, I think the term okay is relative because how could a society that has experienced multiple different wars continues to fight ISIS as ISIS continues to revive itself both mm. in Syria and here in Iraq, uh, being under a humanitarian embargo, lacking all international support and recognition. Uh, the thing is for the people of Rojava, there is no alternative. It's either death or to continue to struggle. Mm. Uh, it's literally a life and death situation on multiple different levels. Death of ideology, death of their future, death of their identity, their Kurdishness, or their uh, multiculturalness, uh, or death by COVID. So uh, the, the, the wonderful thing about uh, what's been happening in the last couple of years in Rojava is that a struggle has developed and the uh, uh, there's a collective revolutionary mentality within society that says we have no alternative but to continue to struggle and to continue to fight for our rights because literally no one else is uh, uh, fighting for us. Mm. So um, it's, it's very easy to romanticize what's happening in Rojava. They haven't been hit by COVID and they're still living and they're still existing but we have to really acknowledge their revolutionary mentality and attitudes mm. and the daily everyday efforts and processes and mechanisms that they had implemented uh, mm. the years before COVID came into action that has uh, really supported and maintained those community uh, structures and bonds. So it's, it's mm. very interesting. I think that Rojava should be a region that everybody should be studying in relation to how to uh, protect a community, how to strengthen, not only um, maintain, but strengthen community bonds and support in order for the community to collectively move forward and hopefully out of the pandemic in a way that uh, allows people to feel like you know, there's a sense of community, there's a sense of belonging, there's a lack of, uh, you know, alienation. Uh, you know, that connection is very, very important to mm. Java. Mm. Yeah, very powerful words. And can you now uh, move to make the comparison with uh, Rojalat, the uh, Kurdish region of Iran? 
Uh, the situation in Rojhalal has been a little bit different, mainly as a result of the policies and objectives of the Iranian government, which has been um, woefully inadequate in its response to the coronavirus. So um, I think it was in February uh, 19 that the Iranian regime officially acknowledged that it had uh, you know, a number of people who were infected by corona, but for months beforehand, the Chinese government had sent out a global call in relation to the virus and its dangers and for some of these states to try to protect themselves. Nevertheless, Iran continued to allow flights to fly directly from China into Iran uh, as a result of business connections, merchants coming in and going, and also because of uh, religious, you know, uh, Iran, and particularly the city of Qum, which is a uh, very, uh, important historical Shia site of religious importance. Um, and so there were a lot of flights to, flying directly to come to China and, and not surprisingly, Qum was one of the, and Tehran were one of the first cities to uh, be impacted by Corona. So initially the Iranian government denied that there was any sort of a pandemic occurring. They blamed typically uh, the pandemic as some sort of a conspiracy by Israel and by the United States. Um, but nevertheless, we started to see some, uh, you know, very, very sharp spikes in, in the number of people who were um, impacted, but also who were actually dying and losing their lives. So uh, at the same time, you know, Iran has uh, been experiencing years of US sanctions, their economy had been failing, there would, you know, there has been decades of corruption and mismanagement. Um, in 2019, we saw number of protests and uprisings, mass uprisings across Iran. Um, and so on the back of these political, social, economic situation and conflicts, we have the Kurdish region, which is typically a region that is often politically, uh, economically ignored, lacks infrastructure development, healthcare development, um, and is basically one of the uh, most underdeveloped regions in Iran. So. Due to this complete absence and failure of the Iranian government to provide any form of support, the, the Kurdish people themselves, um, largely as a result of you know, the Kurdish liberation movement implementing this concept of democratic confederalism, mm -hmm. uh, this idea of you know, grassroots organizations and local organizations coming together to protect society, started to implement their own quarantine. The people themselves quarantined themselves mm -hmm. from the villages to the cities. Uh, the communities came together and they rostered which businesses were allowed to be open on which days to allow the, uh, the, the, the merchants and the people in the markets to be able to still work, uh, adhere to quarantine and to lockdown, but also allow people to, to have access to food, uh, but also allow them to, to have some level of exchange within the market uh, occurring. We've had uh, local organizations who have distributed masks um, and gloves to people. We've had local Kurdish organizations who have gone and documented the number of people who have been affected or who have lost their lives. We have had local organizations that have come together and uh, try to disinfect their, their communities. So what we are seeing as a result of the Rojava revolution, this idea of democratic confederalism and increased activism at the grassroots level and local organizations uh, coming together, we are seeing people-centered responses that completely almost eliminates the necessity of the government. Now, the two responses between Rojava and between Rosh Halat raises a very, very important question about this concept of the nation state, this concept of, you know, these neoliberal capitalist governments that are only a source of violence and oppression, uh, marginalization and discrimination and racist policies. So the question is, what purpose do these states serve? What purpose do these governments serve when we've seen alternative measures and processes put into place by people who have coordinated themselves, who have ideologically informed themselves and armed themselves and found alternative ways of protecting themselves. I think not just in, in particularly in, you know, uh, in Rojava, but also across Kurdistan, the Kurdish experiment and the Kurdish situation can serve as a very, very important learning uh, tool for the international community to see how alternative non-state centered responses can allow communities to survive through not only global pandemic, but global crises. Mm, you know? mm. um, we are seeing in some of these supposedly developed countries, such as the United States, where 32% uh, you know, of the population 
population haven't been able to pay their July uh, household bills. Mm. We are seeing probably maybe about 28 million people who are about to become homeless in the United States. Mm. Um, you know, I grew up in Australia and the population of Australia is about 25, 26 million. That's, you know, more than the population of Australia becoming homeless and living mm. on the streets. So we can imagine that the pandemic isn't something that is going to go away in next week or in a month or two. Mm. It is essential that we start to develop alternative responses uh, that allows us to protect ourselves because we're seeing a complete absence of governments protecting ourselves, whether it's in Iran, whether it's in Syria, it's in the Middle East or in, in some of these Western countries. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, we can yeah, go no, on. Very, <laughs> no, very eloquent, very eloquent, uh, impassioned uh, call for for, uh, for looking at the Kurdish response and thinking about it in terms of the people-centered response as opposed to mm -hmm. this kind of nation-state framework. But back to uh, 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 Rojalat just to, uh, for, for a moment, because uh, all of this is happening against a, in, in a context in which uh, the repression of the Kurdish movement and the Kurdish people seems to be uh, ratcheting up at, at, at the moment. So yes. can you talk a little bit about that? Well, um... I think we need to acknowledge that, again, going back to that state-centric discussion, uh, the coronavirus has been a massive bonus for some of these governments. It was actually a boon for the Ira uh, Iranian government, similarly to the Iraqi government, uh, because we had, were seeing a large number of coordinated and organized responses and protests, both across Iran and Iraq, and they were really taking, uh, you know, developing momentum. And it was very interesting to see where some of these protests would go. Uh, but when the quarantine happened, all of of that were basically uh, squashed, completely mm. stopped. And you know now there's some sort of a quarantine, now there's some sort of a lockdown, people were prevented from organizing and being able to uh, maintain uh, the uh, momentum of, of their legitimate grievances towards their governments. So in, in, in relation to Iraq, it's, uh, Iran towards uh, the Kurdish population, it's always, the Kurdish population have always been under significant amount of oppression, but a different type of oppression to the Kurds in Iraq, to the Kurds in Syria, and to the Kurds in, uh, in Turkey. Uh, the kind of oppression that the Iranian government has implemented has involved, uh, you know, prevention of development, economic, political infrastructure, necessity education, healthcare infrastructure that would allow community to develop a certain level of self-confidence and self-belief in relation to organizing themselves in relation to, to developing trust towards the government. You know, we are constantly, almost on a daily basis, seeing um, uh, what we call kolbers in Kurdish, which are people who are basically carrying loads of goods and transporting it across the Kurdish uh, parts of Iran to the Kurdish parts of Iraq here and often being shot, killed, freezing to death, um, being wounded deliberately, um, you know, experiencing all kinds of violence as a result of economic violence that the Iranian government deliberately, consistently over decades has imposed on the Kurdish people. So the Kurdish people in Rosh Halat are facing an economic situation that is becoming increasingly dire. Uh, you know, the, the economic situation has really, really, really become almost a critical uh, situation. Um, we know that there are people who are on the starvation, you know, uh, borderline, people who are really struggling to feed their families. Um, and of course, we know that when we have these kind of global pandemics and issues and declines, it's usually the most oppressed communities and minorities that are at most risks. Uh, politically, the Iranian government continues to crack down on pro-democracy, pro-Kurdish, uh, pro-democratic confederalism voices, feminist voices, environmentalist voices. Um, just over uh, the last week or so, we saw uh, massive uh, wildfires occurring across the Kurdish mountains and environments. And it's the Kurdish people in the villages who basically carry their jackets and, and basic uh, supplies to go to the mountains to try to uh, turn down or to try to stop the fires from spreading everywhere. Three people lost their lives over the last uh, two weeks trying to turn, you know, turn off these fires. My point is that there is no government in relation to the Kurdish people unless it's repressive, unless it's violent, unless it's executing Kurds and other fellow minorities, unless it's imprisoning them and torturing them. Um, you know, 
large numbers of Kurdish prisoners are currently in you know, mass incarceration in very, very terrible conditions and situations, and they are extremely in danger of contracting COVID. There's been uprisings, there's been prison breakouts, uh, there are a number of female uh, inmates who are on a hunger strike. The situation is becoming extremely, extremely critical, and the humanitarian aspect of this Kurdish situation is becoming worse which is something that isn't easy to say in the back of what's been happening with Rojava, with the ongoing uh, bombardments of an artillery strikes by Turkey into Rojava, constantly the invasions of Afrin and the, uh, the annexation of land again. Um, and again, ongoing bombardment and air art artillery strikes by Turkey onto the Kurdish region um, of Northern Iraq here as well. Iran also recently decided to put in their two cents worth by joining in the artillery artillery strikes towards uh, the Kurdish region as well. So there seems to be a concerted policy of preventing any sort of development, maintaining constant political strife, constantly forcing and pressuring people, villages, communities from into being displaced and internally displaced or becoming refugees, uprooting communities, maintaining a policy of preventing any sort of a long-term stability that would allow some of these communities to breathe, to heal, to start to look at alternative ways in which they can organize themselves. Nevertheless, despite this, and perhaps because of these pressures, the Kurdish communities uh, across Russia are increasingly becoming organized because like Rojava, they have no other alternatives. They have no other support. It's this or to die by COVID or to be imprisoned, executed, hanging from uh, you know, uh, basically, you know, in the middle of this local square, uh, or to be killed by the Iranian government. So uh, this situation is really creating extreme amounts of pressure for people to organize themselves because that's the only alternative that's available. Mm. And then, of course, they're pressured, you know, and face further violence because it's like, hey, they're organizing themselves. They're arming themselves, perhaps. This is dangerous, more oppression. And so the cycle continues. Mm. Mm. Yeah, a, a very troublesome situation. Um, but nonetheless, as you say, there's a, there's a glimmer of hope in terms of so far as the people are mobilizing uh, and, and, and moving uh, along that democratic and federal path. Uh, you mentioned uh, the situation in uh, the north of Iraq, which is where you're at in the Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the situation there since, you're, since you are there. Um, the situation initially was very, very positive, and the uh, the Iraqi, the uh, Kurdistan regional government was very hands-on and immediately implemented a very successful uh, process of quarantining on people. Uh, travel was barred, the local shops were available, the uh, you know chemists were open, uh, all mosques and any local gatherings were barred. Uh, there was a lot of communication between the Kurdistan regional government towards people via social media, people were receiving messages from the Health Ministry, uh, you know, there was a lot of campaigns on, on television and, uh, you know, uh, newspapers and so on. So there, initially there was a lot of communication and the community here immediately knew that it was urgent and it was very, very important for us to adhere to the rules of the quarantine. So initially there was a very positive response. Everybody went into quarantine, but the situation increasingly became um, uh, detrimental because during this particular period, the Kurdistan regional government had not been providing uh, government service workers, um, uh, civil servants, uh, uh, service workers with their salaries. Mm. So yes, okay, people are willing to sit down and to quarantine themselves to protect themselves, their families and their communities, but people also need to eat and people also mm. need to feed their children. Um, and so as of 2020, we are now in July, you know, uh, seven, eight months where people have only received one salary during this entire period, mm. one salary to survive on for about seven to eight months. Um, and that's, this has created a lot of discontent, legitimate uh, grievances towards the government. Uh, the Iraqi government has provided supposedly the, the, the salaries to the Kurdistan regional government. None has flown down to the people. Um, and so this has created significant amounts of conflict. Businesses are closing down. Businesses are closing indefinitely. People are being fired. People are increasingly facing very, very difficult situation. Hope homelessness is increasing. We are seeing all kinds of gender-based violence and abuses increasing. Uh, the situation is becoming increasingly difficult, especially because over the last two to 
to three weeks, we went through our second wave of COVID, um, you know, coming back around and very, very large numbers of people uh, being affected. But this time the response has been one of apathy, one of legitimate anger and resentment. Um, people cannot be asked to quarantine themselves and protect their communities, again, if they are struggling financially and economically. And so people are forced to go into the markets to sell you know, their goods. People are forced to keep their shops open longer usually in order to allow themselves to make up for the losses. Um, and so it's it's becoming increasingly negative and it's, it's very, very tragic because the Kurdistan regional government has the capacity to provide another alternative in which the government protects the community. But we're not seeing that. Collectively, the experiences in Rojava in Bashur, uh, the, the southern Kurdistan here mm. in northern Iraq, and in Rosh Halad, we are seeing consistent failure of those who are in positions of power and authority to protect the people, to represent the people, to provide some sort of mechanisms of support. For example, the Iranian government supposedly stated that it would provide financial uh, support to the people. I mean, for God's sake, we've had America provide a stimulus package of $1,200. This is the epitome of neoliberal capitalism, mm. providing some sort of a, however, minute and uh, ineffective it is, it, at least it has done something. Uh, Iran has provided no financial support. In the Kurdistan regional government here, despite the fact that we're literally floating on oil and natural resources, mm. there has been no discussion of providing mm. not only financial stimulus packages, but actually providing people with their with their salaries. Mm. Um, so the situation is extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, but uh, one, one response we've seen is people trying to put themselves into quarantine despite the economic and political difficulties. The people in the Rosh Halad region are generally following uh, the rules and regulations here in Bashur of Kurdistan uh, in relation to our own lockdowns. Right now in, in Slemania, we don't have a lockdown, but everybody's in lockdown. Everybody's mm. trying to protect themselves mm. because there's no jobs, there's no, <laughs> there's no economy, uh, there's nothing else to do but to literally stay indoors. Um, mm. And I think the implications of this in relation to the relationship between governments and society is very, very, very dangerous. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it really should serve as some sort of a warning in relation to governments using this pandemic to control, uh, to uh, you know, monitor, uh, to censor society, uh, and to really limit and control what people do. Um, I'm going to finish very soon. I know I've been talking a lot, but I just no, wanted to say No, no, it's great. It's great. <laughs> and in Soleimania here, in, in the Kurdistan regional government, in the last couple of weeks, we've had a number of protests, anti-government protests, uh, people demanding their salaries, people demanding some sort of a support, financial support. Mm. Um, and the response has been ongoing demands that, by the government to put people back into quarantine. So quarantining is being used as a method of control and oppression rather as a means to support and protect the community. And I think mm. this is creating a very, very dangerous situation where we could re really reach a, uh, a, the, a crux or a, or a turning point in which the communities are no longer interested in, in or cannot quarantine themselves any longer. Um, and the implications for that in relation to COVID coming back for a third wave, fourth wave, and so on, and people continuing mm. to die. Uh, it's, it's very, 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 very mm. dangerous and dire. Mm. Uh, one last front, which, I, which, I, which you, which you uh, referred to that I, I'm interested to find out from you about what the situation is, is you mentioned that the uh, war on the PKK and Candle Mountains goes on right now. And how is how are those incursions uh, developing? Uh, what is the uh, reaction to those incursions, etc.? Uh, the reaction by the people here in the communities here in south of Kurdistan has been very positive and pro-PKK and pro-Kurdistan. Uh, people here are extremely tired of this false narrative by the Turkish government and the international community who allow Turkey to continue to bomb the people that they're trying to bomb, uh, you know, the PKK terrorists. But when Turkey comes, they, they bomb villagers, you know, they bomb uh, regions that are completely and have nothing to do 
with where the PKK are supposedly located. So this is really an effort by the Turkish government to destabilize the region, to assert its hegemony, to assert its own perspective and ideology and approach, its own vision of what it wants the Kurdish regions to be like, which is a region that is always destabilized, lacks security and peace, and always at the mercy of the international community in relation mm. to uh, safety and security. So um, we're extremely tired of these ongoing uh, bombings and terrorism, active terrorism by the Turkish state. Um, it has increased the, uh, you know, the, the trauma, the pain and the suffering of the community. It's hard enough to try to get through this uh, quarantine while seeing what is happening in Rojava, while seeing the violence that is occurring towards our Kurdish uh, communities in Rojhalat, um, you know, while seeing, you know, our, you know, young men and women being murdered in the Kurdish parts of Turkey in Bakur of Kurdistan, mm. simply because, you know, a young man is listening to Kurdish music. Mm. Uh, he's stabbed by multiple fascists. So there's a consistent message coming through to us as a result of the leadership of the Turkish government that as Kurdish people, we don't have any support. As Kurdish people, our lives don't matter. As Kurdish people, there's no, no international law, no humanitarian policies, no ethics, that no morality that could ever protect us, not just from Turkey, but from Iran, from the, the Assad regime and some, from, from Russia and from some of these other governments that continue to implement violent and oppressive policies towards us. So collectively, the mentality of the Kurdish people is one based on trauma that continues mm. from one act of violence by outside uh, international forces or governments to another. Nevertheless, I really want to end on a positive note. Mm. You know, decades of violence, decades of displacement, decades of forced assimilation has really created a strong sense of identity, strong sense of community, strong sense of who we are, strong sense of the fact that there is no alternative, strong sense that we're looking around at each other as, as Kurdish, different Kurdish communities and regions and seeing what works and we're communicating with each other, we're providing each other with the support that the international community should be support, you know, providing for us um, and we have to do this, this is the only alternative and mm. as a Kurdish woman, as a Kurdish academic uh, as an activist, um, I really want to point out that at the very forefront of this discussion and dialogue and the Kurdish people trying to find a solution internally and externally, it's always the Kurdish women who are at the forefront, who are leading some of these mm. discussions and dialogues, who are implementing new changes and policies, and who are picking up the mantle of resistance, whether ideologically, whether physically, economically, um, you know, resistance against the pandemic, resistance against the pandemic of patriarchy, of capitalism, of this racist uh, nation state model that tells us that certain communities and groups are allowed to live and to thrive uh, on the backbones and the blood uh, and the genocide and ethnic cleansing of other minorities and mm. communities. So my message to the international community is look to Kurdish women because they're the ones who should be who should be watching and learning from and engaging mm. in, in discussions and dialogue with. Right on. Well, thank you very much for a, a very wide ranging uh, uh, discussion. Uh, very informative. Yeah, it's been a thank pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, any last words? Last words. Okay. <laughs> no pressure, Thomas. <laughs> I think we always have to have hope. Okay. What are we defined by? Who are we? How do we want to live? What kind of a world do we envision? Right now, we've been seeing the massive amounts of protests and uprisings mm. uh, by the uh, Black Lives Matter movements. We've seen mm. you know, communities and groups rise up. We've seen alternative methods. We've seen all of these different solutions and discussions and dialogues between different communities to try to find a solution. And I think this is where the power is. The power is in the people, the people coming to being driven by a sense of humanity and love and collective interest and knowing that we can never look to these states, to these governments, to these elites who are sitting in their Mac mansions and enjoying this ride through the pandemic um, while we die on the streets, while we are, we are made homeless, we are 
while we are violated and bombed and silenced and erased from existence. So the solution needs to be in us. We need to look around and despite the violence and the oppression and all of the negativity and the death and the losses and the pain and suffering, we need to see the beauty in it as well. We need to see the humanity in it as well. And we need to be reminded that there is a solution out of this and that you and I, that we are the solution out of this and we have no alternative but to do this. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much.